Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Lori Smith on Blog Talk Radio. It is 6 o'clock here in the morning, um, Wednesday morning, June the 1st. I'm glad to be here. This is One Child Abuse Survivor to Another. We're on for 30 minutes. It's a live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. And the chat room is open. I did pop the link into there uh, from the web pages we've been looking at for about a month now. That's Robert Bernie's web pages from Joy to You and Me. Um, he's also got them on healing.about.com. But I did find his web, his real website and web pages. And so the the website that we've been looking at is www.joy2meu.com uh, forward slash codependence.htm. And that's what we're working on now. And my good friend Gypsy Witch is here. Hello, Gypsy Witch. And I'm glad you could be here. Love you, dear. And, yeah, we're just looking at um, Robert Bernie's web pages. I think he's written some really good stuff here regarding, you know, the inner child and uh, codependence and... Um, relationship type stuff, right, for adult survivors. And so I find this stuff very interesting and helpful, and hopefully other people are getting something out of it too. And um, so we'll continue on with that today. I'm not a counselor or therapist. I say this on every show. I'm just a private citizen paying to do my own shows, and I just want to be one more voice out here speaking out against abuse and, uh, you know, talking about the issues surrounding, you know, adult survivor issues and child abuse and whatnot. So, you know, listen to all of my shows at your own discretion. I'm talking about abuse, and I don't sugarcoat it. I just tell it like it is. And, uh, you know, I'm a survivor, so I, I know what it's like firsthand uh, to be suffering as a child, you know, being abused and not getting any help. And, you know, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. And also for adult survivors, you know, to be another voice of hope for people. I started my healing journey four years ago. And, you know, I was in a pretty dark place before I started my healing journey. And I always had ended up in that dark place at some point, you know, whether it would be you know months or years. But I'd always end up back to that same place and I, four years ago I decided that was it I was I was done living like that and I just decided to to allow myself to heal so that's why I, I, I'm quite a well a ways through my healing journey now but I still have some things I'm working on and I'm still you know still dealing with a few things and still learning still trying to help myself to change some of the behaviors that I picked up along the way from being abused and from growing up in a dysfunctional home extremely dysfunctional home so you know it's been hard for me to to deal with everyday life, you know, I find that everyday life is hard, and uh, most people would consider the stuff that, I'm, that I would think is really hard is normal. It's just, uh, it's just part of life. But for me, you know, for, for survivors of abuse, you know, sometimes these things that just seem like normal uh, things that we should be able to cope with are actually really hard to cope with. So that's why I'm, I'm working on changing some of my behaviors and my belief systems and different things to try to help myself along here because I realized at the age of 41 that I was just really tired of living like that. And so that's why I started my healing journey about four years ago. And um, so, yeah, you know, hopefully, you know, people are getting something out of this. And I know that I certainly learn something every time. And I, I do these shows. This is mainly my healing journey here in the morning, one child abuse survivor to another. I also do child abuse prevention and human rights abuse prevention stuff that night. But I've had to kind of cut those shows off because my sweetheart was in the hospital for two and a half weeks and he was very sick and they weren't expecting him to survive. They were thinking he was going to not leave the hospital and I was going to have to call uh, you know, to the morgue and whatnot, you know, funeral homes and stuff. And so, but he made it out. And so he's staying with me. I had to move in, him, move him into my place and, and shut down his apartment and completely, you know, take care of all that stuff because he can't do it. And so, you know, now he's just on the mend trying to recuperate. So it's been a busy few, a busy month actually. And so I've, I've had to cut some of my evening shows out as well as Dreamcatchers Talk Radio, which the team over there, Dreamcat, I'm, I'm the Canada Regional Director for Dreamcatchers for Abused Children. And the team over there, all the, the people that work with and volunteer with Dreamcatchers for Abused Children have, have taken over the shows, which is great because I, I really couldn't do them. I was in the hospital with my sweetheart most of the evenings till after the show was even, I wouldn't have been able to make the shows. So they took those shows, which is great. So I should be back on my regular schedule in July. I figure, you know, probably right around the, the end of June, first part of July, I should be back to my regular schedule. I sure hope so because I do enjoy doing all of my shows, so... I thank everybody for tuning in. I really do. I've I've almost thirty thousand shows to listen to, and that's a lot of shows. And when I started doing Blog Talk Radio, I was this was um, um, November two thousand nine, and I had no idea how long I'd be doing Blog Talk Radio. You know, I was thinking maybe a few months, and just depending on how many people were listening, and it it just turned out a lot of people were tuning into my shows. And I really appreciate everybody who's taking the time. I've got you know psychotherapists and therapists and counselors listening to my shows. I've got survivors listening to my shows, and I've got other people listening and friends and, you know, my good friend Gypsy which is here with me almost every day. And, um, you know, I appreciate that. She's my good friend in Australia. And so, 
you know, I have a lot of people tuning in, and I appreciate you taking the time to do that. It's a lot of work to catch all my shows, and um, so I appreciate everybody who's done that and been on this journey with me. I appreciate it so, a lot. So we'll get right into this this morning. But if you're under the age of 18, I just ask that you have a parent, or if hopefully you have a parent that cares. <clears throat> I know what it's like to not have a parent who cares about what you're doing. But if you don't have a parent who cares about what you're doing, get somebody else to, like a teacher, a coach, or somebody, a mentor in your life, somebody who's older, who can help you make a decision whether you should be listening if you're under the age of 18. Because I believe in protecting children at all times, and there's a, a lot of adult content on my shows, and I don't know how young the people are who are listening to my shows. So age appropriately, right? Find out, you know, have someone help you to make that decision whether you should be listening. And everybody else has to listen at your own discretion to all of my shows. So keep that in mind. If the show bothers you or the topic bothers you, you have to turn it off. I'm talking about abuse. And for me, it's it was my life. So I don't mind talking about it. I had to deal with it my whole life. And so it doesn't bother me to talk about it. But I know a lot of people, you know, it, it may find it that it makes them comfortable. You know, it may, it may be... Uh, you know, that they're just not ready to hear stuff like this, especially adult survivors who are just on their healing journey, just starting out. Sometimes this type of stuff can be quite upsetting for people. So, you know, you have to listen at your own discretion and you have to turn it off if, you, if it bothers you because it is your discretion to do so. So we'll get right into this and uh, this is codependence defined. And we were talking about the first part of this yesterday, and codependence, he says, Robert Burney, he's a codependence therapist, he's a spiritual teacher and he's also an author. And he wrote a book called Codependence, The Dance of Wounded Souls which I don't have, but I'd love to get. And uh, his website, again, is www.joy, uh, the number two, meu.com, forward slash, and we're on codependence.htm. So it's a great website, and I hope everybody will check it out. And he's got excerpts from his book here, and he says that, um, <clears throat> so we going to pick up where we left off yesterday. He says codependence and inter- interdependence are two very different dynamics. And he says codependence is about giving away power over our self-esteem, uh, taking our self-definition and self-worth from outside or external sources is dysfunctional because it causes us to give power over how we feel about ourselves to people and forces which we cannot control. Anytime that we give power over our self-esteem to something outside of ourselves, we are making that person or thing our higher power. We are worshiping false gods, he says. And he says, if my self-esteem is based on people, places, things, money, property, and prestige, looks, talent, intelligence, then I am set up to be a victim. People will not always do what I want them to. Property can be destroyed by an earthquake or flood or fire. Money can disappear in a stock market crash or bad investment. Looks can looks change as I get older, he says. Everything changes. All outside or external conditions are temporary. So that's from his book, and uh, Codependence versus Interdependence. <clears throat> it's good stuff. Really quite interesting to take a look at that. I know he was talking earlier, like, like last week we were talking about uh, what he had written about uh, saying that, you know, people... Too often judge their judge themselves by the world, what the world standards are, and that's always going to be a failure because if we judge ourselves by 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 our neighbor next door or, or anybody else, you know, we're we're really not doing ourselves any favors because everyone's different. We're all in different places. We can't be like everybody else. We just have to be ourselves, you know, and we can't give that power away. We have to for our self esteem, you know, we have to believe in ourselves. We have to we have to learn how to love ourselves, how to appreciate our our, our strengths and how to work on our weaknesses and how to how almost appreciate our weaknesses too and allow people to help us and, you know, find pe- find good people in our lives, you know. It's not about trying to you know, what what somebody else would judge you by, right? We were talking a lot about that last week. So because everything is everything changes and everything disappears eventually. Looks and money and everything else and you can try to hang on to it till to the last, you know, and so many times, I mean, some people may may be able to do that, but not, but most people can't. And so, it's it's almost a uh, it's a real letdown at the end of the road when we when we try to judge ourselves by what other people consider to be successful or, you know, that you're doing so so good or whatever. I don't judge myself by the world. I really don't. I don't pay much attention to what the world's doing because really that's their business, not mine. And if they're happy, that's great. Whatever you know, like I'm I'm I've found my internal peace. Right, which is amazing. Four years ago, when I started my healing journey, I'll just sort of mention this. Um, I, I couldn't find my peace. I couldn't find peace in my heart. I couldn't find peace in my life. And even though I had this awesome relationship with my sweetheart, we had moved out. He had moved out, and um, because of his illness, right? And we were. He was thinking that he would let me go because he didn't want me to see him suffering to the end, and he felt it would be easier for me to handle his death if if we weren't living together, right? And so what he did was he basically let me go, and he's like, "You should go and find another sweetheart and find another man and get get your life. You know, you're younger than, you're younger, you're healthy. Right? You, you should go, 
And, uh, of course, my heart is with him. So I told him, I said, I can't just dump you, honey. I mean, I love you, so I, I just want to be with you to the end. Right? So I didn't care if we were living together or not. It didn't matter to me. So that was the period where I was actually on my own and allowed allowed myself to heal during that period. So it was actually a good thing for me. I don't know how good it was for him, but I certainly I needed the time away to begin my healing journey. Because even though I was in this relationship with this awesome man who I love dearly, he does you know, he can't be that be all and end all for me. Nobody can. Like I was hoping somebody could do that for me, but actually I realized four years ago that I was gonna have to be the one to find that peace in heart. I was gonna have to be the one to make peace with my past, with my life now and in order to have peace, in order to survive, because I was going to kill myself. I had been contemplating suicide for so long. It was just part of my daily routine. And, I mean, I wouldn't think about it every day, but what I would do is I'd plan it, especially when I started feeling depressed or down again about my past and about what had happened. And, you know, if things would go through my mind, and certain dates on the calendar would come around, and I'd be depressed again, and I'd be thinking about all the stuff that I had been through as a child and all the stuff that my parents put me through and, and my siblings and, and different things and just my, my view of how the world viewed me was, you know, and I just thought, man, you know, I just want out of this pain. You know, how am I going to get out of this pain? I couldn't find my peace. <clears throat> I couldn't find peace, you know. And so four years ago, I made that peace, you know, and that was great. And for me, it was the Lord Jesus Christ, praise God. You know what, for other people, it could be something else. And, you know, that's the thing. Like, for me, I know what it was for me, and that's great. But I just, you know, I was able to finally have peace in my heart and I knew it that and I knew when it happened too because I was like, Oh my God, I finally got my peace, thank God. So I went to I got I started this job four years ago about and now yeah, it's about four yeah, four years ago. I started working at this bank and it was just a temporary job. But I the first day I was on the job or maybe the second day, these people were like these I was working with were like, Wow, you seem so happy and you seem so like, so joyful and, and that, that's just not normal. We don't usually see that around with most people and I said, you know what? I found my peace. But they had no idea, these people, until the, I, I, I showed them my book that I wrote, because I worked there for quite a few years until after I wrote my book, A Life of Death and Redemption. And many of them bought the book. They said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you you got to be kidding me. You were just contemplating suicide the month before you got this job. And I and I was like, yep. Yeah. And I said, I was in a very, very dark place uh, a month before I got this job, and I met you guys. And But, when, but after, uh, before I got the job, for one month, I finally found my peace, I've, and I wish this for everybody. I really do because I was able to make peace with myself, with my life. You know, I mean, I like I know what it's like to be on the other side of that, and that's why I'm doing these shows, and that's really why I'm I wanted to be another piece of hope for people out here, you know, who think that it's just not possible. I know when I was 13, even 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, you know, seven years old, I would have never ever thought that that day would ever happen. I would have, you know, uh, people would say. You know, ask me a question at the age of 13. And say, do you think you're ever going to find peace? Do you think you'll ever be able to be to feel like a whole person, to feel undamaged, to feel loved or or cared about? That this world matters, that you matter. I would have said no, right? Because I couldn't see any light. I couldn't see any hope. Um, you know, that's how down and how how destroyed and damaged I really was as a child. And I mean, I, I couldn't see hope. You know, and I didn't care. I'd do I'd do drugs, and I I didn't care if I died. I would do so many drugs, I'd just pass out and I'd just overdose. And I didn't care if I died. <laughs> it didn't matter to me. You know, I'd drink like huge, huge bottles of alcohol all at once, you know, big fists and, 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 and whatnot of, of hard alcohol. And I, I, I didn't care if I died or if I woke up or not. You know, like that that was my life as a child, as a teenager, especially a young teenager. And then, um, you know, into my 20s, still using drugs, heavy drugs. And, you know, and and... and, and People would say, "Do you ever think you're ever going to find peace in your, in your heart, you know, and be able to get rid of this anger and this distro- this, this hatred, for what your parents have done to you, especially the parents?" And I would have said, "No, I didn't. I wouldn't think there was any hope, you know." And that was me four years ago. So that's why I know, I know where people are sitting. I know that dark place. I haven't gotten. You know, I know what it's like to be on the other side of this. I'm so thankful to be now where I'm at. But that's why I wanted to be one more voice for people because, uh, you know, this is really something when you can find your peace. I, I certainly wish that for everybody. You know, and I, whatever it is that brings you peace, that's what I wish for you. And, you know, that's the thing. I found mine, and I was so happy. I went to that job, just started that job coming out of hell and uh, into into uh, the light, into peace, into love, into into the fact that I was going to allow myself to heal and not be destroyed by this by my past, you know, by, by what my parents had put on me and a sibling, 
And I thought, you know, there's no, I'm going to do this. And I felt so empowered and so good. And, you know, that's this is four years later now today. I'm sitting here so much in a better place, even though my sweetheart is, is you know, was nearly dying two weeks ago, you know, nearly two and a half weeks ago. And, I mean, you know, it's like, I mean, these things, are, this is part of life. Things happen, you know what I mean? It's very, it's tragic and it's sad, but, you know, this is part of life, right? We have to accept the, a lot of these things. We just can't, there's no way to get around them. Death is death and we all have to face that at some point and I've had to face that my whole life but the thing is, is I, I would not have been so able to face it had I not made that peace with my life and made made peace with myself so I'm kind of glad that me and my sweetheart did split for those five years because I really needed to work on myself in order to be able to find peace you know so that you know in the future like when, when the time comes when you know I'm not going to be struggling so much when I like as I was before. So I tried to explain that to him. He finds it a little bit hard to understand because he he was not abused as a child. He was he was doted on and loved because his he his uh, four of his siblings uh, that were younger than him died in a house fire. Uh, and he was outside playing, and the other siblings that were all ages like like six months, one year, you know, two years, three years, whatever the ages they were. Um, four of his siblings died in a house fire, and his mother and father couldn't get to them. The fire department couldn't get to them, and and Cecil was the only child that was outside, not burned up and not not smoked out, you know. And uh, they lost their whole lost their children except for Cecil. So they doted on him, and they loved him because he survived and he he wasn't killed in that house fire. And so they tr- they just loved him and they just treated him so well. He doesn't understand you know, what it's like to grow up in a home where people tell you they hate your guts and kick you around and slap you around and, and threaten all the time to hurt you or kill you. My parents, you know, my mother was didn't necessarily have to slap me around every day. She would threaten to kill me on a regular basis, you know what I mean? That was the the fear of living under their thumbs. My dad was always threatening to kill us. And, and even with the physical beatings and whatnot that came about, you know, throughout the, the whole time, you know, there wasn't necessarily beat on every day, but I was threatened every day, you know. And so there was always the threat and the fear, you know, that they kept us under their thumb very, very much. And so he doesn't understand what that would be like, you know, to be told that you're a rape child and you weren't wanted and, and that you should just be dead, right? My mother used to always say stuff like that, like I should have died. She'd be like, you should have died with the other stillborn babies. And here's Cecil's parents telling him, oh, we're so glad you survived. We love you. You know, and I mean, he he doesn't have a clue what that would be like to to grow up like that. So, you know, I mean, um, he does he does what he can to try to help me out, but he couldn't he couldn't really take away all my pain. But I told him I said, you know, I found my peace, hon. You know, you don't have to worry about me now because I think he was really quite worried before, um, you know, before we split up. He was kind of worried whether or not I'd be able to handle his death because he was you know he's given ten years to not he's, he's lived ten years, given two years to live, but he's lived 10 years now, terminally ill, and I mean, he was kind of concerned, he's thinking, oh God, because he knows my past, right, I mean, I did tell him I was abused, and we talked about a lot of stuff, and, you know, I told him, I said, honey, I'll be fine now, because I found my peace, you know what I mean, but before, four years ago, if I, you know, I don't think I would have been able to be, I wouldn't be able to be uh, so strong in this, you know what I mean, because I was um, looking for external things to bring me peace, which was him and other things, you know what I mean, that what I was thinking that you know, this latching on to other things instead of getting hold of what I needed to inside, and so I think that's the that's the big that's the key, and that's what that's what Robert Bernie's talking about here. All these external sources, you know what I mean? We might look at, you know, basing our self esteem and basing our self worth on, you know, and and how we're going to cope in this world based on how much money we have or or a person in our lives that can be this person for us. It's very temporary. <laughs> you know what I mean, and it, it, we can lose it all in a matter of seconds. I told this one—I was talking about this one girl yesterday, that, or the day before—that said to me that that people that you know get allow themselves to put on weight and get dumpy. She was—I was working with this person for like three years, and she would make these comments. And she said, "Well, when people just let themselves go and they get fat and dumpy and they don't curl their hair and they don't fix themselves up," talking about women mainly. She says, I think they just give it up. They just give up on life. And I said, well, I said, sweetheart, let me tell you what. I said, have you have have, have you ever lost everything? Because she was rich and she was born into a home that was full of money, full of, you know, false gods, right? And she was like, I said, have you ever lost everything, right? And she said to me, she says, well, no. And I said, well, you could, <laughs> Right? I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, sweetheart, but you know, you could you could lose everything just like these people out here who you're calling dumpy. So let's not be calling people dumpy. You know what I mean? Because they've probably come through hell 
and, you know, people cope the best they can. You know what I mean? Like, they do the best they can, and just because they don't look like you and have a million dollars, you know, doesn't mean that they're that they're not having a good life. You know what I mean? I've, I, you know, she bases everything on money, prestige, and looks, right? So this is exactly what, um, you know, Robert Bernie's talking about, codependence, you know, and this whole, you know, inter interdependence thing, giving our 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 whole self worth means something by what we own or by what we look like or all, all of this garbage, right? It has absolutely nothing to do with it. And people sadly make that mistake all the time. And you know, I I I, I actually am very conscious and aware of that, so I don't base myself on I don't base my life on any of that stuff. I don't even care. It's like whatever. You know, I'm just living and I'm just I'm just doing the best I can and I don't try to keep up with the Joneses. It's just a, too much work and it doesn't mean anything to me. You know, but as so many people will put their whole lives into that, base their and base their lives on other people too. My sister's very much codependent, and she can't live her own life on her own terms. She has to other people have to meet her needs all the time. And I mean, I was doing the same thing until four years ago. You know what I mean? Until when I decided to heal and allow myself to heal. I mean, I was pretty much doing the same thing, and didn't even realize it. And so I'm sure that my sister doesn't realize that she's doing that either, but she is, you know. And it's just, it's really sad because a lot of people, even if they weren't abused, um, live these codependent type lifestyles, you know what I mean? And it's it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's just a sickness. It's a disease, really, a behavioral issue that, you know, people will try to get their needs met through somebody else. And my parents were very much like that because they hated each other, so they were always using the children to get to each other, you know what I mean? Like what whatever they were doing, they wouldn't really, you know, communicate the, with each other because it was turned violent. So they always used us for whatever their needs could be. Like my mom didn't want my dad even coming close to her. So anytime she could get me to do something for her or just to even talk, she would talk to me instead of my dad because she hated my dad. Even she hated me too. But she hated my dad more than me, I'm pretty sure. And so, you know, so that's the thing. It, it was pretty bad, you know. So she kind of, she just used people to get her needs met. And then at the end of the road, when I was 30 or 29, you know, 29 years old, right around 20, I think I, think I just turned 29 or was 28 and a half or something, she told me that, that we were worthless. We didn't mean anything to her. She didn't love us. I told her, I said, what about your children? What about, what, what about your children? I named them off because we had a huge argument. She was... She was starting her crap with me, all this psychological, emotional BS again, right? She couldn't hit me anymore. I mean, here, she's this old woman, and I'm like 28 and a half years old. Like, I mean, what's she going to do? But, I mean, she, I, if I was younger, I'm sure she would have tried. But the thing is, is like, she, she was, you know, starting her emotional, psychological garbage with me again. I should have just killed myself. You know, she killed you years ago and all this. Blah, and all this, I was crying the blue. She was depressed. She was manic depressive, you know. And I and I told her, I said, what about your children? You know, we had to count for something. I mean, come on. You can't tell me that, that Irene and Kevin and and Robert and Chess and Howard and Kathy and myself did not mean anything to you. We loved you, Mom. Like, we absolutely loved you. And we cared about you. You know what I mean? We're, I was trying to see what she would say. I actually detailed this in my book, A Life of Death, Redemption. And she, she said, no, you didn't mean anything to me. You were just worthless. She was just cutting me to the core. You know, and I said, you got to be kidding me. I said, you had a chance to let us go when the social workers got involved and you guys got busted on child abuse charges and you could have let us go. But you pleaded the judge and you begged the judge to let us stay. Why? To get your own needs met. That's why. Man, I was choked. I was so angry because she put me through all of that abuse and those horrific beatings and that garbage and those name callings and spitting on me and cursing on me, making me sleep in my throw up and treating me like garbage. And, you know, for what? For nothing. <laughs> I was just like, oh, my God. You know what I mean? At the age of 30, being, well, close to 30, 28 years old, being slapped in the face with that again. I was just like, you got to be kidding me. You know what I mean? I thought that the years before had kind of meant something to her. You know what I mean? No, she was just using people. Just using people to get her own deeds met. She didn't love us. She didn't care about us. She was just using us, you know? And, I mean, that's pretty sad. So she died a broken woman. I mean, she died. She went to her deathbed a very broken woman. She 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 was, you know, she was abused as a child, abused her whole life, and she was, she did the abusing too when she got older, and she had kids, and she became the abuser, and she was just a broken woman. You know what I mean? And I, I thought about that. I left, and I, I left. I moved two thousand miles away. I went to Canada, and I was just gone. I finally ran away at the age of twenty nine, and um, yeah, I thought I could, I could, thought I could kind of leave my baggage behind there, but of course it followed me up here and. You know, I was just like, oh, my God, I couldn't believe what I had to deal with. You know, I was just like, oh, 
holy crap, I've been taken advantage of and abused my whole entire freaking life. I mean, I was just choked. I was just angry and raging and realized how much hatred I had in my begin for them, you know what I mean, for both my parents. And um, this is the kind of stuff people will do, use people uh, to get their own needs met. I decided I didn't want to do that, you know. So when I started, hear, started hearing people talking about codependency and what it is, you know, I started to really look into it. Because I thought, man, I do not want to be like that. You know, I, I try to actually model myself. <clears throat> excuse me. I try to go the opposite of what my parents did, right? <laughs> because I figure, hey, I'm going to at least do something good if I don't do what my parents did, right? And so uh, anytime I, I'm, I have, I've got a behavior going, I try to actually think about whether or not it's, fr- it's something that my parents were doing. And then I try to think about, wow, is this something that parents put on me or I'm doing because of my parents? And then I try to do the opposite because I know that my parents were just the worst. You know what I mean? They weren't the worst. I mean, there's other parents out there that were that are worse. You know, but I, they were. I consider them right right in there with the Hellions. You know what I mean? Like they were they were demons. You know what I mean? To me. And um, you know, they just created a life of hell for us, right? And that's why I wrote that book. And um, you know, it, it's horrific what people do to to their children because they're trying to get their own needs met, and 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 they're so miserable, and they end up mistreating their families, and it's absolutely ridiculous. Even if there's no physical abuse, it doesn't matter. The person can totally destroy their family just through emotional, psychological abuse. You know what I mean? Like this is absolutely horrific. And uh, I know so many people have suffered through this stuff. So, you know, that's why this codependent stuff is very important to me. And I actually do pay a whole lot of attention to it. Um, He says here, he says, the dance that we learn as children, the repression and distortion of our emotional process in reaction to the attitudes and behavior patterns we adopt to survive in an emotionally repressive, uh, spiritually hostile environment is the dance we keep dancing as adults. And we're driven by repressed emotional energy, he says. We live life in reaction to childhood emotional wounds. We keep trying to get the healthy attention and affection, the healthy love and nurturing, the being enhancing, validation and respect and affirmation that we did not get as children. And this dysfunctional dance is codependence. It is adult child syndrome. It is the tune that humans have been dancing to for thousands of years, vicious, self-perpetuating cycles of self-destructive behavior. And that's exactly what my parents put us on. They they were on it, and they put us on it. Right? Two of my siblings killed themselves. My other sister had a horrible marriage with her husband, and she abused her children too, uh, got away with it. And uh, one of my brothers is miserable, you know, the only one that's left now. One of my brothers was killed, so that doesn't really count. He was murdered. So, um, But the other one, my other sister is dysfunctional, codependent, and everything else, trying to get her needs met and her life met, lived through other people, instead of just living her own life on her own terms. And so, you know, complete destruction, complete destruction. You know, I mean, my dad is still mentally ill, and he always will be. And, I mean, you know, I pray for him, but, you know, I've been praying for him for a long time. But the thing is, is it's harsh that, that people keep dancing this dance. So I really want to get his book, Codependent uh, Code Dance of Wounded Souls, because I think it's really going to be a good book to read. So I hope to get a copy of that pretty soon. But his web pages here are awesome, so I hope everybody will check this out. www.joy, J-O-Y, the number two, M-E-U, dot com. So that's his web pages, and he's got everything on here from you know internal child work and codependence and and relationship stuff, all kinds of stuff about relationship. He's a codependence therapist, Robert Bernie, and uh, just awesome stuff. You know, I'm gonna love to get a hold of his book. So he talks. Oh, we'll, we'll continue on with this tomorrow, and we're about halfway through the page, a little bit more than halfway through there, and then we'll just pick up for another page. So thanks everybody for being here. I have a lot, a lot of good friends here with me today. You know, I got Chris and a guest, and I got Gypsy Witch, and I just love you all. Thanks for being here with me this morning. You know, it's just awesome to have you here with me. And, um, you know, on quite a few mornings I see you here, and I just appreciate your, you, you being here with me on this journey. You know, I know I'm, I'm not alone, you know what I mean? And I appreciate that. And you guys are my good friends, and I I care about you a lot, and I think about you, and I do, I do keep you in my heart and keep you in my prayers. And, um, you know, you guys are just awesome. So thanks for being here with me today. And I'll be back on tomorrow morning, same time, same place, 6 o'clock a.m., um, same time, same place. We'll just do it all again. Make sure you take care. You know, if you're if you're listening to this and you can't cope and you're thinking, oh, my God, I can't cope, you know, you call a crisis line. You remember. <clears throat> you just remember that Lori said, Lori from the Blog Talk Show on Blog Talk Radio said to phone a crisis line. You do not ever give up. Not ever. I don't care what the circumstances are, man. My brothers killed themselves. They gave up. Don't do that. Not ever. You just you hang in there for a better day. I don't care how bad it gets. You make a phone call. We will, you know, there's so many of us that have been to the edge of hell, and we've been down to the bottom, lowest pits of hell. And you know what? You don't allow yourself to be destroyed by this. 
I don't, you know, you make sure you get some help. I don't care what it is. You call a crisis line, you call somebody. You make sure you stick it out for another day. There's better days ahead, but they won't be if you don't stick around. So make sure you do get some help and don't suffer on your own, right? It's just terrible. Have a great day, everybody. We'll talk to you real soon. Bye-bye.